Well, good morning to everybody. Good to see all your wonderful faces. And uh, we conclude our series, uh, Spirit, uh, in the book of Acts. You know, I was thinking through this this morning. When we go through times of uh, uncertainty, times of vulnerability, uh, hardships, it's quite normal for us to feel full of various emotions, uh, full of worry, full of anxiety, full of stress, fear, uh, sadness, depression, discouragement, uh, even anger. And yet I wonder if it's possible for us, regardless of what circumstances we ever go through, to be full of something else, to be full of faith instead of doubt, to be full of peace, to be full of joy, full of goodness, full of kindness, patience, self-control. And what's encouraging about the Word of God and the involvement of the Holy Spirit in our lives is that He can actually help us be full of the right things, full of peace and joy and faith. And so for those who are new here, what we've been doing is we've been looking at the book of Acts, and uh, the writer of Acts is a physician by the name of Luke, and he's teaching us about the role of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers and the church. Excuse me. And it's known as the Acts of the Apostles, but it could also be referred to as the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit plays such a prominent role in the lives of the church. And in Acts chapter 2, this is when we see the promise of Jesus that he was going to give an amazing gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, who's part of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And um, on the day of Pentecost, this is when the church is born. This is after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. This is 50 days later, and here the Holy Spirit comes. Luke, in his first book, the Gospel of Luke, he writes about the birth of the church. Excuse me. I've been speaking quite a bit today. And uh, he starts off about, starts talking about the birth of Jesus. And yet in the book of Acts, he's now talking about the birth of the church. And although the Holy Spirit functioned in the Old Testament era, he would visit people and inspire them to do certain tasks and speak on behalf of him. It's now on the day of Pentecost where the Spirit of God now initiates the church, brings a transformation in the hearts of people and by the way, is that Maureen at the back? I think it's Maureen. If it is Maureen, God bless you. I've just heard that you become a granny. God bless you and that wonderful journey there. And here on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit now comes to dwell in the lives of believers as a permanent companion, a permanent friend, a permanent guide, and as one who will be on their side, one who's here to do us good and will help them on the journey to reach and, and empower them and inspire them to reach their full redemptive potential. And so my prayer in this series is just to understand the Holy Spirit a little bit more, recognize He's more than just a doctrine to be studied, but a person to actually be enjoyed and experienced in the journey of life. And then He's this amazing God who loves us. And so today as I conclude our series, and then we're gonna have communion together, is I've titled the message, The Spirit Who Fills Us. We've spoken about the Spirit who's in charge and He's close to us and He's creative. We've spoken about how this Holy Spirit unites us, the Spirit who guides us and also inspires our speech. But here, I want to talk about how the Holy Spirit can fill you and me and what that actually means. Because for Luke the writer, as, long, as well as Paul, one of the key characters in the book of Acts, one of the great apostles, uh, being filled is a favorite for them being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, why does Luke use this word? Does it mean that this is a once-off experience, that when the Holy Spirit fills us, that we're now completely filled? Or does it mean that there's an ongoing filling that takes place? I believe it's an ongoing filling. And if we look at Acts chapter 2, verse 33, on the day of Pentecost, it says now, speaking of Jesus, now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven. At God's right hand. And the Father, as He had promised, gave Him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us just as you see and hear today. This is Peter talking about Jesus and how the Holy Spirit has, been come, has come to pour Himself on us. It's an overflowing. It's not just a trickle, but an overflowing. Here, the Holy Spirit wants to fill every part 
of our lives. And this was an amazing encounter, an amazing occasion when the Holy Spirit visits the church. What Luke is doing is he's using pictures to describe the involvement of the Holy Spirit in my life and your life. And so we're going to see the pouring of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit as a a metaphor, a, a metaphor of what he does as he influences each one of us. I remember a few years back, I was, uh, I was pretty, I was, I was feeling a bit burnt out. And I mean, some guys might think, goodness, in your 40s and you're really talking about that. Life can be tough, as we all know. And uh, I was emotionally afraid. I was feeling exhausted. I knew that I just needed pressing and just touch God. And, and uh, so I went away for a few days retreat, just prayer. And I remember I was just speaking to the Lord and I walked alongside this beautiful river, came to the intersection of the river and this waterfall. And I remember as I was standing there just feeling tired and worn out, it was this scripture just jumped out at me uh, from Philippians where it talks about the eternal supply of the Holy Spirit, the eternal supply of the Holy Spirit. And it was in that moment that I realized, you know what, Chris, you may be feeling dry and weary and tired right now, but the supply of the Spirit, the energy, the divine power and the presence of the Holy Spirit is available to me right now. And all I've got to do is just yield and just open up to Him. And there was was a refreshing, and I believe that's exactly what happens when the Holy Spirit comes to fill us. He influences us for good, but also refreshes us and restores us and begins to shape us. The Holy Spirit, when He fills us, impacts us. He does something good for us, and He begins to influence us. And so here, Paul, along with Luke, will use this phrase, being filled with the Holy Spirit on numerous occasions. Uh, all across Acts, and then also in the New Testament, and specifically in the book of Ephesians. And there's one scripture that I just want us to focus on just for a few moments today, from Paul, from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, that'll bless your life. Okay, so don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's just focus on the second part of this verse where it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here, Paul, along with Luke, is encouraging believers uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the tense here is not a once-off experience, but it could be said it's be being filled. That this is a journey in our lives where we need to be continuously filled. It's a process of opening up to the role and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, nobody can truly be filled by the Holy Spirit other than Jesus, but this needs to be an aspiration or design, all of us, that, hey, listen, I need to be more and more influenced and filled by the Holy Spirit. What is Luke and Paul asking of us when they're showing us story after story uh, of of people being filled with the Holy Spirit? They're they're not encouraging us to to manifest more and more gifts of the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes some Christians can think, well, more when you're filled by the Holy Spirit, you're just going to manifest more gifts of the Holy Spirit. It can be part of that, but it's more, this is their focus, is they're interested in manifesting the life, the character, the spirit, the nature of of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what the filling of the Holy Spirit begins to do to us. It influences the life and character of the, of the person. Why will they use the word filled? We could have used other terms. Why the word filled? It's interesting when you look in the scriptures, even in, in Ephesians, which focuses a lot in and on this, um, he, he will use, Paul the writer will use being filled with being filled with other things, like filled with God, filled with Christ. And Paul and Luke are saying that those who are filled uh, should reflect the character or the spirit of the person filling them. So what is truly filling us? What is controlling us? What is influencing us? Because that will affect the way we behave. And so Luke, in the book of Acts, will begin to use this word full of. This is what he'll say. He'll say, describe, he describes a man in, in Luke chapter 5, rather, as being full of leprosy. Not his fault. This was a condition that was controlling him, influencing his life, influencing his body. Uh, he will also talk about uh, Bar Jesus, this sorcerer that was inspired by an evil spirit as being full, he uses that word, full of all deceit and villainy full of all deceit and villainy. Here he was being influenced by something that was evil and it was influencing his behavior. In Acts chapter 5 verse 17, the high priest and his officials who were Sadducees were filled with jealousy. 
So they were filled with the spirit of jealousy. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 23, uh, Luke will say, you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. So we can be full of the wrong things. Psalm 50, verse 19, we'll use this word filled again. It'll say, your mouth is filled with wickedness and your tongue is full of lies, full of lies, full of wickedness. And so these are conditions that can control us and influence us. We can be full of the right thing or full of the wrong thing. And so Paul and Luke will now talk about, hey, the, the benefit of being filled with the Holy Spirit. So they'll use examples like of Stephen, who was full of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was controlling them. They were full of the right thing. In Acts 7 verse 55, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, being influenced by the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. It's an amazing story to read when you have time. Acts 13 verse 9 talks about Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. So here, Luke and Paul are wanting to encourage the church, encourage the readers, and the Holy Spirit wants to encourage you and I today. Hey, listen, what are you full of? What do you want to be full of? Well, we want to be full of the Holy Spirit because there's so many benefits in being filled by the Holy Spirit. And this is a central, important issue to Acts and uh, the, the, the right of Acts, Luke. He's wanting to show everyone, hey, listen, you can be controlled and guarded and influenced by this person called the Holy Spirit, and it needs to be our aspiration. Now, going back to verse 5, chapter 5, verse 18, he says this, don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Now, he's not saying there's anything wrong with a glass of wine, but he's saying being drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What is he doing here? He's drawing a parallel between the actions of someone who's drunk and intoxicated and influenced and under the control of alcohol versus the life of a person who's now under the influence and the control of the Holy Spirit. And so if we're going to be controlled by the wrong thing, that could ruin us. But if we're going to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, that's going to be a blessing for us and those around us. And a major significance of being drunk, if you think, is, is that is the person you're no longer in control of yourself. The, the drink is in control of you. How many of us, and don't raise your hands, when you look in your journey of life, when you've had one too many, you look back at the... Look back the night before, and you kind of think, I met people I never knew, kind of remember certain things I said and did, and there was a part of you where you, the drink was more in control of your actions. And so, yeah, Paul is teaching, and listen, the Holy Spirit is to be the controlling influence in your life, the loving influence. Actually, not to try and suffocate the joy and peace, but if anything, release all that God has put in you. And so the Spirit needs to be that force, that controlling influence. And this obviously begins to affect us emotionally. It will begin to heal us. It begins to shape us. It begins to do good things for us when we're being more influenced by the Holy Spirit. And what happens, there's ongoing growth, ongoing transformation of our character, of our uh, 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 helping our personalities, healing our personalities, healing our relationships, um, even in terms of our marriages. And just quickly, just a quick pause on, on that. The, spirit, the series on Home Sweet Home that starts next week is not just for married couples, it's for singles, for everybody. So I want to encourage you to do everything you can to come along, bring your friends and your family, because I believe it's a, it's a word that the Holy Spirit wants to speak into our homes. And homes are going through challenging times, and maybe your home's going through blessed times. Bottom line is we can all lean in and learn from God's word to encourage us in our homes, whether you're single or married. But here, when the Holy Spirit fills us, it, He transforms our relationships. He begins to help us in our homes. He begins to also help us in our spirituality and also in the shaping of our character. So there's positive consequences <clears throat> that bless us and also bless those around us. Now, what we're going to realize when the Holy Spirit, the word holy speaks of wholeness. It also speaks of different. It's a different spirit. He's a Holy Spirit. And He is not here just to keep us on the straight and narrow. Sometimes we think God is the one who's the school teacher. And I think it's school teachers, but the, that, that strict teacher or that policeman who's here from heaven uh, to, 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 to chain us and hold us back. If anything, the Holy Spirit wants to set us free.
free. He wants to bring us freedom. Those things that have sometimes held us back, he wants to break those chains and set us free so that we can become whole and different and, and, and find freedom in, in Christ. And so the Holy Spirit is not that like heavenly bouncer, so to speak, but he's ra- rather a loving shepherd, a loving guide to a God that's helping us in the destination, helping us reach um, that place of, of wholeness and freedom. Whenever you see the Spirit filling people in the New Testament, and specifically in the book of Acts, you see positive things happened. Uh, In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it says, After this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the Word of God with boldness. So the benefit of being filled by the Holy Spirit was there was a new confidence where these people were being vulnerable and persecuted and facing huge opposition as a result of them being inspired by the Holy Spirit. What happens? There's a boldness. There's a confidence that comes to them. Then we know about Saul, who was a persecutor of the church. He hated Christians, doing everything he could to undermine the church, stop the progress of the church. He's on a road called Damascus, and here he encounters Jesus. He's temporarily blinded for a few days. And while he's in this town called Damascus, a guy called Ananias, who knows about how threatening uh, uh, Paul is, Saul is, and the Holy Spirit says, I want you to go to him and pray for him. Now, can you imagine being Ananias? And thank God that Ananias had the boldness to go and pray for Saul. He goes and prays for him, and in verse 17 of chapter 9, it says, so Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, the blindness leaves, and in verse 20, it says, and immediately began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is indeed the Son of God. Here is a man who's literally transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and now is filled with the Holy Spirit and even healed of his temporary blindness and now becomes a great preacher of the gospel and a great, great missionary and we know wrote quite a bit in the New Testament. And so when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when you look at biblical pattern and even experientially, we see how there's this ongoing transformation that's reflected in our testimony of our words and our lives, and it begins to speak more of Jesus. Now, what's wonderful about the Holy Spirit is He has not only the capacity and the power to transform us, but a desire to help us grow. Because let's face it, when you look in the mirror, as good looking as you might think you are, the bottom line is we all are works in progress and need to grow. And God wants to grow us because he sees so much potential in every one of us. And so he has this desire to transform us, to grow us. And the spirit is the one who can produce fruitfulness, a fruitful life. It will be in Galatians chapter 5 that Paul will contrast two types of people. Some people who have been controlled by their appetites and their sin. And they don't have help because they've never asked for the help. And then those that believe in Christ and now have opened their lives to the help of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit begins to operate in them. They have now His presence, His wisdom, His power helping them. It doesn't mean that we reach this place of being perfect, sinless perfection. However, what we do have is a perfect, loving Holy Spirit who loves you more than you'll ever, ever know. And He's wanting to enable us to fight against the pull of sin and ultimately win. And then Paul begins to talk about these beautiful attributes, positive attributes that make life pleasant for all of us, make life pleasant for our homes, for our businesses, for us in our interaction with people. In Galatians 5 verse 20, he says this, when you guys are going to be filled with the Spirit, this is what's going to be happening. If you're going to be more influenced, what's going to happen is the fruit of the Spirit will be produced, which is what? It's love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And see so here Paul is saying, listen, if you're going to be led by the Spirit and filled by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to produce something positive in you and me, these beautiful attributes. And I think it's something that we all desire. Hey, don't you want more peace, more joy, 
more patience when we get so irritable and so impatient and that kindness and that faithfulness, that self. These are all things that we know are good for us and we all desire it. And the Holy Spirit is the one who says, listen, I can influence you in these areas if you will be open to me and you allow me to influence you. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who comes to develop His nature in us as we yield to Him and listen to Him. Now, the Holy Spirit's desire is to help you and me, to fill us, to refresh us, to shape us, to strengthen us. However, there's obviously a part that we play. Uh, We can't just say, we can grieve the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, or we can yield to the Holy Spirit. We can be led by the Spirit. The Bible says those that are true sons and daughters of God are those that have made a decision, Holy Spirit, please lead me, fill me, influence me. And so we've got to now create opportunities for transformation, opportunities for growth. And it can just be practical things where we just say, okay, Lord, I need to spend more time with you. It doesn't mean that when you're in the car or when you're in the office or you're at the gym or wherever it is that the Holy Spirit, he can, he can speak to us at all times and he does if we open to him, but also just creating some opportunities and some time to say, okay, Lord, I want to spend more time with you. It can be reading the Bible. It can be writing something, a song or uh, a poem for those who like writing poem about the aspect of God. It could be thinking about one dimension of God's nature and just dwelling on it and thinking about it. It can just be worshiping God. I believe worship is such a crucial part as followers of Christ in keeping us fresh and, 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 and strong in our faith. The Bible talks about when we worship God, the anointing breaks the yoke of bondage. Sometimes we're feeling things that are resisting and we're trying to break through, but sometimes it's through worship and allowing God's presence to come and we sense the Spirit of God that can break certain things, uh, wrong influences in our life. And so there are different ways, practical things that we can do, but also for us to understand, and listen, there's areas that I need to grow. Uh, not to put that, uh, not to make us interest, too introspective, but just to realize, you know what, I get, when I'm under pressure, this is what I do. Or the moment someone does this, this is how I behave. Whatever it is that we need to look at our lives and say, okay, Holy Spirit, I need to set some life-giving targets for personal change. Not that it becomes a religious, legalistic thing, because the Holy Spirit wants it to be life-giving and to give us hope, not bondage, but then just create opportunity. These are things that I'd like to change in my life. And what it does, it just creates a desire for us, all right, over the next three months, whatever it is, you set a time, uh, and you just say, Lord, this is an area that I'd like to grow. And I believe as we do that, as we set targets, what happens is the Holy Spirit helps us in that. And there's faith, there's a one-mindedness um, where we just say, okay, Lord, give me grace to do this. There was a nationwide poll done in the United States that wanted to reflect the life of Christians, the spiritual life of Christians. And the conclusion was that although the majority of Christians wanted to change for the better, few had created frameworks for change to facilitate the desire in any way. And so what I believe we need to do, again in a life-giving way, we need to erect some scaffolding in our lives that can provide opportunities to ensure that growth occurs. Um, now, one thing that you're doing today on a, on a winter's day and when there's soccer and everything, you could be anywhere, but you've chosen to come to church. I believe it's creating an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to fill you and influence you. Uh, when you're involved in spiritual community, that's also a beautiful way for us to be influenced by the, These are things, these are targets, and these are things that we can work on. Um, also serving. People serve in the church on Sundays and during the week. We've also got the upcoming servolution. These are opportunities that we create ways for growth to take place. But there's another area that I believe is so crucial for all of us that's essential for us being filled, and that is listening to the Holy Spirit. If we want to be in, uh, no one can influence you if you and I are not going to listen to them. And so the more I listen, the more you and me listen to the Holy Spirit, that's a way He can influence us for good. And in Acts chapter 19, we looked at that story a few weeks ago when Paul was set on going a specific direction to go and strengthen some of the churches that he had planted. And yet the Holy Spirit diverted his plans and said, listen, I'm wanting you to now go to Macedonia. And as a result of him going to Macedonia, other people, other communities were affected by the gospel. Why? Because Paul obeyed. He listened and obeyed. There was something about Paul. He had learned the beauty and the power of just listening to the Holy Spirit. 
And the Spirit of God, we know, we've done a series on this where He speaks to us. He speaks to us through His Word. He speaks to us through sermons. He speaks to us through visions and dreams. He can speak to us through various means and conversations and various circumstances. And let me just quickly say this. It's not that we've just got to set targets. Sometimes just in life, you go through seasons, and if our heart has a heart of humility, and we lean and say, Holy Spirit, what are you teaching me? He's always there to help us and, and grow us. And the book of Revelations, which is always an interest to so many of us, but it talks about the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the first few chapters here, we see letters being written to seven specific churches, different churches, all united by the blood of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. But the recurring theme to these, mess- to these churches is hear what the Spirit says. Hear what the Spirit says. And I believe for our own homes, we need to say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to our home? Because right now, maybe we're full of strife, or maybe we're full of this and full of that, but the Holy Spirit's saying, hey, listen, I need you to begin allowing me to focus in on this area. And so, what is the Spirit saying to us as a church? What the Holy Spirit might be saying to us as a church might be different to a church down the road. The deal is this, we're all this part of the same body of Christ, but specific messages to various homes, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Even when I look at, the, when I, when I look at a new year, I'm always saying, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to us as a church? And, and we've spoken about courage, and we've spoken about frequency, and we've spoken about calling and purpose, and we've spoken about the Holy Spirit. Now I believe that the Lord wants us to speak into our homes. He wants to help our homes. He wants to restore and strengthen our homes. And so when we listen to Him, that's how He influences us. And He may not reveal everything we'd like to know, but He reveal what we need, what we need in those times. The Holy Spirit won't force us, won't drive us. He's like a loving shepherd. Uh, he will encourage us to pursue certain things. Sometimes it might be challenging for us, and we think, Lord, how am I going to pull this one off? But he gives us a grace and a power to enable us to do it. And also, what we're going to realize is when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, is it in line with the Bible? It'll never contradict what the Bible says. Um, and also, do you feel a peace? And are you, do, you feel a, do you feel comfortable in your spirit, man? In your spirit, do you feel a peace? And generally, if you feel a peace, then it's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God doesn't lead with fear. Yes, in your emotions, you might be thinking, wow, Lord, how are we going to pull this off? I'm a little worried here. But inside your spirit, you've got faith and confidence to, to, to go for it. So dialogue with the Holy Spirit is so important. It requires care and sensitivity and the Holy Spirit speaking and we need to listen to him. And this is a journey and sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't, but we just gotta open up to him. Two specific ways that I know we know, but just to once again, just remind us in on this is the way we are filled by the Holy Spirit is by listening to him and listening to him through his word. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, will talk about the the, the benefit of being filled by the Holy Spirit, how it affects our relationships, our spirituality, and also how we overcome the lies and the strategies of the enemy. And you'll say this, you'll talk about the armor of God, and you'll say, listen, you've got the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so here... You must understand, in the New Testament, the early church, they didn't have the New Testament like we had it. So here, Paul is saying, listen, there are going to be occasions when the Spirit of God, just in your relation, will want to speak to you and through you and just be willing to listen in. And there will be peace, there will be faith, and there will be hope in it. The Holy Spirit wants to help us. And also, if you think about a sword, a sword is there to to. to penetrate um, and to, to cut away those things that would hold us back. And sometimes we believing ungodly beliefs about ourselves, about people, about our future, um, and, and the Lord wants to allow the word to actually move away, move those things away from us. You even look at Jesus when he was in the wilderness. What did he use? He used the word of God. And sometimes we try to just face his situations just in our own willpower, and we kind of feel like, why are we facing defeat? Let's use the word of God, the sword of the spirit. In our homes, our businesses, in our relationships. And so the Holy Spirit wants to um, see, help us see that there's the sword of spirit, the word of God, where he speaks to us and that we can be couriers of the spirit, so to speak, that he speaks to us and sometimes it applies to us and then sometimes it applies to others. And we just got to present those words to people. Another side of being filled and listening to the Holy Spirit is through prayer. Prayer is so important. It's just having a dialogue or conversation with God, wherever you are. 
And I think this is once again something that's so crucial for every one of us. And it's amazing how the enemy will try and distract us from the importance of just having some life-giving conversation with our God. And Paul will say this in Ephesians 6 verse 18. He says, praying at all times in the Spirit. I believe the more, if we want to be influenced and filled by the Holy Spirit, what we're going to do is need to learn what it is to pray at all times in the Spirit. This is not speaking about praying in tongues or praying in the spiritual language, and I'm, I, I believe in the beauty of that. It's a wonderful gift, and uh, Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all, but in this context, it's more speaking about the partnership with the Holy Spirit, this cooperation with the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Holy Spirit can actually speak to you as you're praying, and that you can begin to pray certain things that He's revealing to you, uh, because sometimes we can see prayer as just an opportunity just to throw requests and petitions at God, and how to advise God, and how this outcome needs to ca- take place, but often it's not that way. It's more about us listening and yielding to the voice of the Holy Spirit who advises us how best to pray. And so what happens is you're sitting with somebody and the person sharing the the, the request, it could be a family member, friend, church member, whatever, but what's happening is what we're doing is we're listening with one ear to what the person's saying and and, and needing, and on the other hand, we're also listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it's listening that the Holy Spirit begins to guide us and help us. It's actually a beautiful way to teach us to pray. Because so often what we can do is we can just go straight into praying, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I reckon, sorry, I've just got a, a, a moth that's a holy moth trying to come to me. And um, is he still here? Anyway. So, but it's, it's a beautiful way to pray, because what you're doing is in those moments, sometimes we don't know how to pray. Well, I think we all face that. I think, Lord, I don't know how to pray out of this. I'm feeling absolutely helpless. And it's a horrible place to be, and I think we've all faced it, but it's in that moment the Holy Spirit knows how to pray. And He will inspire you with what you need to say, which will enliven your spirit, and then also do something to the person that you're praying for you, praying for at that moment. And so Paul wanted the church to understand by being filled, it's also developing that prayer consciousness, where you'll say, pray without ceasing. And that's not meaning that you're praying every single moment, but you're just having an awareness of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit wherever you are, and that you can just, in that moment, yield. I remember years ago, really went through a difficult time, was pretty broken and busted, and, and I phoned a, a wiser older pastor, and I remember I shared the whole story with him, and I remember he went quiet for at least a minute. It felt like eternity. But because I knew him, I knew he had trained his heart and his spirit to not always just speak and just to pray instantly. He would try and listen to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what are you saying in this moment? And I remember after that minute, he said, Chris, this is what I'm sensing the Holy Spirit saying. And I remember that was words of faith and words of life and just gave me hope for the future. But just because of a man that took time to yield and listen to the Holy Spirit. So when we pray, whether it's for yourself or for others, take time to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And then even your own personal time, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. You know, there's a story about uh, a group of radio operators in 1930 and uh, who had turned up for an interview for a job. And what happened is they were told to wait in this crowded waiting room and to wait their turn to be interviewed. And... They weren't hearing anything, they weren't hearing anything, so they got restless, and uh, they, 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 sorry, that's just the worship team, and, um, and so what happens, they get restless, and they're, learning, they're fidgeting and all that, and a latecomer arrives, and he sits on one of the open seats, vacant seats there, and he, to their surprise, he jumps out of their seat, walks to the interview room, goes and closes the door. Comes, after the, comes out a few minutes later, and he says, hey guys, I've been offered the job. To the astonishment of everyone present, he told them, guys, listen, just listen. And what they heard was a Morse code was being tapped out, informing them that the first person who responded to this message should come into the interview room and they would be offered the job. What happened? You had the same group of people all wanting the same thing, but only one was listening. Only one was listening. 
And so in the same way, I believe when you look at the kingdom of God and how it works, even the parable of the sowers, where Jesus spoke about seeds are being sown, that the good ground, those that produce fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, are those that learn to listen. We hear the word, we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and we begin to do it. So my prayer is that we would know that the Holy Spirit wants to inspire us, He wants to fill us, He wants to influence us, He wants to grow us, He wants to empower us to fulfill His aspirations in you. He sees your purpose, He sees the potential, but we need the helper of the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that we, as we conclude the series and we go into a time of communion, that, that we've explored someone called the Holy Spirit, part of the Godhead, uh, we could spend years and years and years just talking about the Holy Spirit, but I believe it's an important thing as followers of Christ that we understand the role of the Trinity, and especially here in this series, the role of the Holy Spirit who wants to be with us. He's on your side. He's a friend. He's a God. He loves you. He's powerful. He wants to refresh you. He wants to be involved in your life as you encounter Him in the journey. And so the Holy Spirit is this gift that's given to you and me, and all we're gonna do is just say, Holy Spirit, come fill me, come lead me, come guide me. Could we just bow our heads just for a few moments? And I'm gonna ask you just to do something you, no one's under any obligation on this, but just on your lap, just raise your hands. You can raise them higher, or just on your lap, just raise your hands towards the Lord. Just simply say, Holy Spirit, can you fill me? Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just refresh and strengthen hearts and minds and bodies here this morning. Lord, that we would understand that you are real, that you are the eternal supply of the Spirit, that you never run dry, that there is your river, your waters of living water that are here to refresh us and influence us and strengthen us and encourage us on the journey. Holy Spirit, that you're also here to transform us and change our characters. Lord, to help us begin to enjoy the life of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, help us become people of peace, people of joy, people of patience, people of kindness, people of self-control, people of goodness. Holy Spirit, we just yield to you. Help us develop a sensitive heart to your voice. When you speak to us through your word, and when you speak to us through prayerful conversations, Lord, as we pray alone and pray for others, that we would know that you're always there with us, guiding us, directing us, giving us words of life and freedom. Pray, Lord, that you would just fill us. Pray, Lord, for homes here today. Lord, where maybe the atmosphere has just been challenging, stressed, anxious, worried. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you begin to fill homes. Lord, as hearts, Lord, would just say, Holy Spirit, come fill us. Help us. Lord, for people in the business world, Lord, just needing help right now, just facing the pressure of financial pressure or customer issues or organizational issues, whatever it is, that Holy Spirit, that you'd give us hope and that we'd see that you can influence us. Lord, that we wouldn't just live in the circle of concern, so to speak, but that we'd learn, learn to live in the circle of influence, the things that you can help us influence. And so, Spirit of God, we say, fall afresh on us. Lead us, influence us to be influencers for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. The longing in all our hearts, sometimes we're not aware of this, but it's just to encounter God. We're more of God. We have created to have an eternal relationship with Him. Amazing truth about the Trinity is in harmony, unity. And that Jesus said the Spirit would glorify Jesus. The Spirit would convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and our need for a Savior, a need to be reconciled with our God. It's when we encounter God, that's when we change. When we encounter Jesus, it's how we're saved. Maybe there's someone here this morning 
you've never begun a new life in Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only way that you find true life and truth that sets us free is meeting a person, and it's Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will speak to us sometimes without us even realizing it, but showing our need for a Savior. If that's you, you want to make right with Jesus this morning, all you're going to do is just simply say, Jesus, save me. Save me of my sin. I thank you for your forgiveness, that you can forgive me of my sins. I open the door of my heart, and I welcome you in to be my Lord. Rule and reign in me, Jesus. Give me a new heart, a new life. Take control of my life and make me into the person you've created me to be. Good news for those who've just prayed that prayer for the very first time. Reconciled with God just by acknowledging Jesus as our Savior and Lord. This is our moment where also we look at the cross and we look at what Jesus has done for us to forgive us. He gave his life, a a great price paid for our sins to be forgiven. His grace bigger than our biggest sin, our biggest failure, our biggest fear. And his grace comes to save us. It's not by good works that we reach salvation, but it's all by his grace that saves us. This is our moment for us just to with thanksgiving and just gratitude, just say thank you, Jesus. What you did on the cross for us, you didn't have to do it, but you did it out of love for us because we've all fallen short of the glory of God and all need his forgiveness. This is our moment for us to also just consider the fact that his body was torn, was nailed to a cross, was broken so that we could find wholeness and freedom in and through Jesus. To also see Jesus as the bread of life, the one that we rely on for our recovery, for our restoration. It's a moment for us just to examine our hearts and maybe just to forgive, maybe to receive forgiveness. Maybe just to tweak our attitude in terms of, hey God, I've been trying to do this all by my own might, all by my power, but it's by the Holy Spirit. We rely on you, Lord, for everything. We thank you for your body that was broken for us, this bread representing your body, broken so that we could be healed and forgiven. Let's partake together. And in the cup of the new covenant, Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. It's because of the blood of Jesus that we are forgiven and that we can go into the throne room of grace boldly and confidently every moment of the day, all because of Jesus. Let's partake. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just seal this moment for us. and Thank you for your word that brings life and hope. And we thank you for your presence that's here together as a church and also when we go home our separate ways and we're not alone that you're always there with us always for us not against us here to help us in our journey and so holy spirit we love you we rest in you and we just want to be guided by you and be filled by you in jesus name everyone said amen